Victoria. Have... Okay, there we go. Okay. We had some people with their hands up. Um, would you like to address them or should, would you like to just begin your presentation, my dear? Well, I'd like to go to the presentation because the presentation sure. may answer them. It's a very meaty presentation because um, I've only got an hour to tell you about things that are extremely important to me as an intercultural trainer and how we really can make a difference. So it's um, let's let's take a look at that and then we'll do our questions. And I'm going to suggest even a follow-up session for those who are interested, or to certainly continue on and we can keep discussing. Terrific. So those are two alternatives. It's all yours. Okay, that's great. Let me put it up and, and hopefully we will not have any more um, setbacks. So without further to do, um, I, I, Cindy, I'm just a, I wouldn't have a chance to check. Are you hearing me and seeing everything okay? Perfect. All right, great. All right, I don't see anyone, but I'm gonna ask you to keep the questions for me in, in the chat. I like to use the chat box, and if um, either you can make me the host, or you can get some of those chats for me. You are, but you are the host. Here as long as anybody wants to stay. You are the host. Okay. Okay, that's great. Okay, then I should be able to see the uh, see the comments. All right. Welcome. Uh, this is all about now science of culture, which was the original title up until October 7th. And then I added, and crisis, because our work in neuroscience place in the workplace and crossing posters has really never been more important. I think there's a real role for us to serve. And as communicators, um, hopefully we can guide us through the next month and maybe even years of, uh, of crises using intercultural uh, or intercultural background. And certainly this has become our reality. There was a conference on the VUCA world a few years ago, and it looked nothing like our realities today, where breaking news is not only violent, volatile, it is extremely violent. How do we handle that? It is uncertain, chaotic, ambiguous, and it's actually very cruel as well. So our agenda for today is going to look at, first of all, why do we as interculturalists even need to understand the brain? It's a relatively new field for us. What is that um, mind-body culture connection we hear so much about? And can we really say that culture has been programmed for culture? In the second part, I am going to look at how to use neuroscience in our work. And I'm going to give you tools to look at the field that I noticed what the notes I have for most people is that you all seem to be familiar with the intercultural field and training. So I'm going to look at what we have been doing and say, okay, now, how can you reintroduce uh, new, these new concepts or for the first time and be very practical with at least one of those models? There's a conference coming up in Niels, uh, in uh, soon and in the summer in June. And so this is really a highlighting thing that I will go into much more in depth. I am very interested in your interest. So please do find, uh, you know, through Cindy, you can certainly contact me. And at the end of this, I will want to know how you are going to be able to apply this for our future direction. So let's take a look at how we do all of this in crisis. This is very new for us as a culturalist. A brief background about myself, and I'll keep to what I think you need to know. I am a neuroanthropologist, and my background comes from the physical side. I was really one before there was even a name for it. So we go back a ways. And what I did is after getting my master's work during my postgrad, I had a choice of a PhD or being certified. And I went the route of certification because I felt like it gave me the most tools that I needed to be able to work across the 50 countries I've been working with companies, uh, Fortune 500, with um, agencies, ambassadors, sports people. I needed to have tools. And that's what I'm going to be sharing with you today. Some of it is in the game that I developed. You may be familiar with, many of you may have 
created. It's called Neurodiversity Diversity by Diversity.com, George Simon's groups, and um, also author of Brand Italy from about 10, 12 years ago. And that culture has changed significantly. So I'm not going to go into that, but I do highlight, and as I go, I'm going to really talk about since there is such an interest, what I think are some of the best tools out there. You'll notice that I have uh, highlighted three of mine. I've got about 10 or 12, but the I think that uh, Joseph Shaw's group does an excellent job with, with uh, certification and his blogs you might want to be a part of. I will be talking about um, Shannon Murphy's uh, brain states that she will be presenting also with me actually in the video. And she offers it as does the Neuro Institute, this is David Rock's group for leadership, and I'm a certified Neuro Leadership Institute coach with them. Those give me the tools that I feel give me um, authenticity when I speak, but also the how-to. So for anyone who would like to follow up with that field, you might. But how did I really get started in this? And how can someone apply what uh, we're doing. So just very quickly, um, I started my, my work in um, Africa, in West Africa, and I was working for various age groups, and I was very interested in the witchcraft that I was seeing, the voodoo that I was seeing. And the reason was, is I saw amazing healing. I saw some amazing harm. I saw people that were paralyzed as a, as a result of um, feeling they had gotten the wrong information from a uh, wise man. I saw people who were near death. I saw young I uh, Irishman who passed through and told the story of how he was told to sleep on a special rock and he didn't believe it, but he thought, well, I'll die here. And in the next morning was fine. And so the question was, what was going on? And this is 30 years ago. Well, luckily I have Margaret Hurt Margaret Mead as a major professor who had a certain far more class than I did for sure. And she took us through the National Institute of Health. She said, this is where you need to be because they're beginning a new pilot program on biofeedback. And so able to use all of that incredible somatic healing of everything from that to you know uh, various things that I've seen around the world to saying, how could we use our mind to begin to heal ourselves. So this is a topic I feel a great deal um, of affinity for and is rising more and more. So we'll be talking about that a little bit later about how you can apply it as an intercultural healer. So before that, let me define neuroanthropology and how we differ than some of the other interculturalists. And that is that it is the study of the relationship between the culture and brain. But what we really get excited about is the actual biology of the brain. How is it wired for emotions, for how we see things? How could things like that, uh, which have to even occur? What is cultural development? And how can we really help our clients? This year, it's going to be AI. So now there is a new field if you're interested in it, which is called the neuroscience of, it's, in our, it's basically anthropology of AI. So we will be introducing in Leland some of our future conferences, some neuroanthropologists who are asking a whole new set of very important questions. So we have morphed as a field. Uh, we actually got a name in 2008 when Daniel Lynn presented us at the American Anthropologic and Society. Excuse me, I'm mumbling my words. But this is from Joseph Salt, and he's with the Japan Intercultural Institute that I mentioned, and he put together this wonderful slide that he shares, which is, why are we doing this? Why brain main sciences and culture? Well, certainly the upshot of it all is, is that we can take our theory and turn it into science. And these books for your records where are probably most of them you are familiar with and some new ones that we will be adding to the list. Um, the, there's a conference in Florence in 2019 and uh, some, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the work of May Nguyen um, and she was our uh, Nguyen Fong, and she was our opening speaker 
keynote speaker who did a wonderful job of talking about tabula rasa, the blank slate, and the brain science behind Kosker. There was, uh, we heard about the inclusive brain, cognition, and consciousness from Bennett and Hong. Mark Pegel talked about how, oh, it took us back to the very beginning, which really hooked up with, if you're interested in the field, you go back to Stephen Pinker in 2002. Now, the one that has helped me probably the most is Silas from Sinobu Sitemaya as an anthropologist and an intercultural, he talked about environment in the brain. And that's when suddenly I could begin to really make a difference in how I presented intercultural and across. And, and what is really uh, in had biggest impact, obviously, is the advances that we have made in the first, the uh, magnetic re uh, resonance, which is the FMRI, EEGs. We can actually see, we will visit this slide again, we can see bias in the brain. Now that's that's pretty Cynthia, extraordinary. Cynthia, so, I'm going to thank you for just a minute. Do, do you think you are showing us slides? Sorry, I'm going to have to see if I can I can hear that. Will you repeat that? Do you think you are showing us slides? From the slide, yeah. We don't see any slides. Can you see, you don't see any of the slides? No. no. Oh, good lord. Okay, just a moment. Um, You have, okay, this should not be happening. Let's see. Screen share? Do you have a screen share? Now do you see it? Nope. No. Can you, what setting do you have me on? I have you on um, co-host. On co-host, okay. Yep. What what do you see? What do you see at my end? You. Hmm. All right. Anybody have any suggestions? This has not happened to me before. So as a as a very frequent presenter. Um, have you clicked on Have you clicked on screen share? Yeah. What I have on is you. You are. Wait a minute. Wait one moment. Now what do you see? You. Now what do you see? You. All right. Um, do you have it from, do you have the green? My, do you have the green screen. screen share arrow at the bottom? Okay. Um, all I have is slide sorter view. No, do you have a green at the bottom? There should be a bar and it says, here we go. No, it okay, says screen share. It's, it's a green screen and share. Well, I've got share screen on. No. Yes. Now, what do you see? Ah. Oh. You see a whole bunch of screens. <laughs> That's exactly what you should be seeing. All right. So now, <laughs> I am sorry, but I think that maybe my little hour in the dark there got me a little bit um, messed up. So let me go. All right, we don't want to see this. Um, where, wait a minute, wait we can see lots and lots of screens. No, Maybe I need my view. Okay. How's that? Good. Yes. I think this is your I'm first. So sorry, this everybody. First this is not my normal day, nor is it my normal thing. So this is your breaking news. You haven't missed too much. This was our. Um, we've got this, and I will just start where I am speaking now, and where I think it's important. You have the information. I want you to have that slide. And this is where we were speaking about the Florence conference. And here we are. This is where I was now. All right? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, so, um, and I do want you to see this because as you can see by the slide, 
we can now measure it. And I'm going to come back to it when we talk about the the um, when we talk about the uh, uh, actual aspects of bias. So this is where we need to be, which is on the encoded brain, and what makes us different. So we as in our cultural science, and I have looked and I have seen that most of our office. We've often been, I know I presented this particular slide for over 30 years. And we uh, talk about it being, uh, we, we can give the theory, it's a wonderful theory about how it's underneath the water, is underneath the surface, we have our custom image sites that give rise to the behavior. Well, now a tool that, uh, uh, looking back at that work from Matabula Rasa, from Kitimaya, we, this is another slide I often show to talk about, um, talk about hierarchies, to talk about different cultures, and when looking at the interdependence, the group dimension for rice powders and harmony, I think what we can add to that discussion now, and I often mention the fact that it, when we see rice paddies, we know that people need to work together to be a complete group to do it. But we have more information because we can go back to 11,000 years. And we know that one of the reasons for this, for the rice is that it was too cold and humid in the south, especially in the south of China, to uh, have wheat. And so the group function of having that diet put that into the genetic encodes that into the genetic, into that interdependence that is so different than we get the moment there is wheat, which they had in the North. We can think of America. We can think about the independence. You could be all on your own. As an American, I grew up with stories about Chicken Little of who will help me break my bread. And it was always, well, I will, in the end, I will do it myself. You can't do that with with uh, rice. And after 9,000 years, what is the effect on our own culture with that? And we can think of desert populations, how it di differs with the looking where it's all about the water. In fact, we have things like when we talk about the the outrage over the young brides, well, by 10 or 12, it's always about the water rights. So that gets embedded into culture and culture practices. Um, who can yell the loudest to protect a water, uh, water, a little water in the oasis will get slowly embedded into the culture. And now in Palestine, uh, I look to the words of Mahmoud, Mahmoud Dar Darwish without getting into the politics. It's the land we carry is in our, in our blood. And that goes back back to 10,000 years. So all of these things are beginning to, when we can now show where some of this is, this is hearsay that we've been giving. And now suddenly we have the research that has been done, in this case by Sue and Khan, on the uh, where, when, if you say, family, or if you say mother, where people put themselves as, uh, as a individual and where they put their family, whether it's separate or together, differs greatly in, well, in terms of relatively so. But we can begin to see differences. And I'm seeing this in differences with people from the Mideast. We know behavior-wise, you ask the Saudi, they introduce themselves, and they will say, well, my name is uh, Ahmed Abu Hussein, and my mother is um, Noah Abu Hussein, and my father is, and they give you this whole lineage, and the rest of the team is thinking, well, no, no, that's not what we're talking about. But if you want to do business in many Arab countries, you better know somebody, you better know those families. But now we can say, but also look how they are together. So the geography, the history, the religion, all of these things, Buddhism that is, uh, and Taoism, Taoism, all of these things have come together uh, now most lately to produce the epigenetics. So we've suddenly started moving into an area that is more scientific than it has been before. Um, I think many of you must have seen this um, old lady, young lady, 
I've had it seen been in many, many presentations. Uh, I'm not wild about it, but often participants do like it and they like to point out the differences. I use it to point out, say, the difference in the north and south of Italy. But now we can say something different. You can show this flood. You can show this one. And you know, what do you see? Do you see in this photograph? Anybody be able to throw me out a couple of words that I can touch? Fish. Cindy, what do you see? I see a redfish. Mm -hmm. That is the standard Western answer. If you were coming from the Asian world, you would probably paint out the back of this fish because it is about context. If a Japanese person sees, uh, has two people blank and sees a, sees a diagram and sitting in the middle and of a happy or sad face and two people on the side that are sad, the answer might be, well, I can't be happy if the people next to me are sad. They, uh, in terms of description of this, it's very similar. It's all the context that something has. And we have, I don't have time to go into it now. I will in some other seminars, but um, there are many different tools that you can use to show this difference. Basically, the answer is, is that the ventral visual cortex is different, and we have culture also in the Wernicke, the Broca areas. So that's a little bit more in depth than just being able to show the uh, visual effect of the old lady, young lady. And here it is larger where you can see the self and the mother in different um, different parts of the brain. So in a longer training, we can now begin to take our values questionnaire that we always use and we can start, start to give some neuroscience behind individualism, behind the egalitarian and actually behind almost all of these, which we will go into at a later date. But it is because it, it culture is socially learned, geographically influenced, and genetically inherited. What we're interested in is that it is neurally embedded. And I really suggest this work by Mamie and Fuang Mei, which is intercultural communication. She does a number of our keynotes and presenters. And follow her work. She's uh, really uh, one of the gurus in this field of brain body culture. So let's take it a little little further here. And I see we've got some I can see anything I want to do. Um red fish finger colors. Okay, we had somebody in here for corals. Okay, thank you for that one. All right, well let's go back and see now how all right the um what is our real difference here? And we have, if any of you saw the movie Lucy, it, we had Scarlett Johansson, who played the Lucy, who went back in her own brain about 35 to 300,000 years ago. So when we talk about the brain, we talk about it and, and the age of it, just how old is it? And the other character is Lucy, the Australopithecus, who is one of our early ancestors. And so the question is, how just, you know, how different are we? And in a longer presentation, I would get uh, some of that feedback from you, but the this image in it is also one that's in the public domain that was often used just to talk about culture. And what kinds of things do you see? Why don't you put that in the chat box? What immediately hits you about this old culture? Anything you want to add there? Survival. Survivor. That's a very important one. Okay. Anything else? Men protecting women. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Danger. Okay. Yeah. So this differentiation of of roles that was certainly true, no doubt of identity. But as you go back that long, that is going to make it, women. We know women could smell better. Well, you needed to if you were going to do all the cooking, and which mushrooms would would uh, would do you off? The difference in hands and movements. But a lot of that has been changing. And gender is one of the hardest things to discuss these days because there's so much that is going on in terms of um, changes in the brain. So. 
we'll take a, a and what the main I think the main thing around that is it has not changed as quickly as that is actually when you look at that it's all about fear it's what could come into that cave and anything that came in there was probably going to kill you or eat you so we very what the one of the strongest um, instincts that we actually have rather than behavior is the neurochemistry of, uh, of bias. And it actually is only 200 and milli milliseconds before you determine whether or not somebody is like you or different than you are. And if they, uh, and you be, your, circuit, your brain is circuitry begins to make very definite decisions. And that is so strong that it is registered. Actually, bias is in the same place as, as pain is in our brains. And here, if we take a look at, at, at some of the work that has been done on this, we can begin to see that, in fact, the moment we see somebody, our brain will light up in terms of just how different they might be. We begin to register race. We begin, we give an idea of what class we think people are. All of this define, define our we, them group. Now, the good news is, and the difference, main difference between these two Lucy's is that with neuroplasticity, we've got 86 billion neurons. And those neurons can make another billions of connections. And in fact, there's more connections than there is stars in the universe. So we do have some kind of control over this. Um, and with those 60 trillion connections, think of all of the room we have for behavior change. And that's the exciting part. And we'll be talking about some of these neurotransmitters too short to go into these much other than to say that a lot of not only does what your focus on grows and we can make changes, but it affects also the hormones that we get. And I'm going to demonstrate this for you in the next uh, slide, one, uh, one of the next ones. And obviously, both uh, Lucy share the instinctive brain, they both share. The pre PFC, we call it the prefrontal, sorry, they do not both share that. They absolutely don't share. Only our modern day Lucy has the prefrontal cortex. And that's where we make our decisions. And the key here is this limbic system to what we're looking at today. When we talk about the decision making, the things that are going on with the kinds of crises we're having, with the kinds of emotion that's going on, our limbic system. The hippocampus is where our memories are stored. A lot of our spatial memories are stored. And the amygdala is the one that takes in after the thalamus sends it in, is the one that uh, is going to start to make its decisions, a quick, uh, quick decision as to whether it goes up to the PFC or whether or not it begins what we call the amygdala hijack. And this is coming from Daniel Goleman. If you've seen my work before, I usually have it in here because I think it is so key to where we are today and where we're going to get any change and movement is recognizing the effect that this external stimuli. I just knit. Uh, the first thing that occurs is that there is in the logic system, there is you you something occurs. Okay, you your brain is we know now is going to pick up any kind of a threat. The moment there is a threat that comes into or an event, if it, we see it as a frightening one, it will bypass our usual logic system, and rather than going up to PFC, it goes to the primitive. What uh, not the what. I have to be very careful. When you use the word primitive brain, it is not a triune brain. These all came up together in a matrix. And we as intercultural have to be very aware of that. But the, the emotional brain, this is Daniel Goldman's work, and I would repeat that, I would replace that always with the emotional brain. And that's what sets off the hormones when we saw those neurotransmitters. 
of the adrenaline to make us run faster, or testosterone that runs out to our um, extremities to be able to go under to the spine to attack. Our cardiovascular system is talking louder and quicker. We are suddenly pumping up all of that. We begin to feel it. We sweat. We have all kinds of uh, reactions. We might feel it in our stomach as rage comes. And it takes at least 20 minutes to move from that to the thinking brain again. Having all of my lights just go off, having all phone contact calls go off just before I was supposed to make a major presentation, I can tell you, I have just gone through uh, the emotional, this uh, emotional thing. And my normal brain circuits just aren't quite working where they were. Because what happens with that is it just goes in a normal shut, uh, a normal, um, it just keeps going round and round and round. And so one thing we want to think about is what, as in a culturalist, what are people today being doing to get out of this? Well, one of those answers is always about when we look at their hormones. We want to be able to talk about how people, I, I just want to go back to that for a moment, because when we have a situation like that with the emotional uh, high tax. There are things that we can do. And as we said, the, we've got also working in there the hippocampus with the memories. We're going to be having a lot of post-trauma distress. And you want to be thinking about some of the techniques that you can use to, to help your clients through this. And way before I had the cultural adaptation curve, which, for instance, we took just, just in the, uh, just coming overseas, starting a new job, as the, uh, as many of our clients did, I say adjusted to life abroad. We talked about the honeymoon phase. We talked about hostility. Uh, uh, more than hostility, it was just a difficult time. We would be in the dip. It was hard to get things uh, accomplished. And then after we'd been here for a while, and this is something I said for 30 years and gave many examples to, they talk about how then after a while it gets a little better, we get attached, et cetera. Um, and certainly Michael Bennett, we would take him through the development of the, the, as we go into integration. But now we have something different you can add. You can talk about those hormones. You can talk about dopamine. You can talk, uh, the dopamine is the one when you first arrive and you have lots of things to do. So you're so excited about getting there and finding the right apartment and getting things done. And after you've been there a little while and accomplished things, and many people come over in August, September is coming around, and the serotonin begins to kick in as we begin to make friends and we get closer. And we've often said it's around the holidays that people say, I am home. They get attached. Their oxytocin goes. These are things that you, you can add. But now we've also got, in the middle of this, the cortisol. And the cortisol is just... You know, it, it's certainly a part of the dip that is there. And now cortisol is becoming, and just the shock has really become a, um, in the last weeks and months, I think for all of us, it's something that we really have to be dealing with. So I'm going to give you in the short amount of time that we have left, three, some techniques that you can use. And I apologize for going so quickly on this, but hopefully we will catch up uh, afterwards or in another, uh, in another session. But the first one is the brain state uh, model. It is one that you may have uh, read about in the seminal work of, um, that we have by Shannon Murphy and, uh, and her colleagues at brain state, have, where she's very clear about what to do when you get this kind of a cultural thought. And the first one is to recognize your brain state, to be able to put the words around where you are, because it is by noticing, by being able to define it, by putting the words around it, that you can begin to shift your brain state. 
that 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 um, the neural pathways you can. This is the most important thing is neuroplasticity for almost everything we can do. It's how we make the changes, and then we can maximize, maintain, and maximize those brain states. And she takes it through in terms of uh, this model, which she will present in real and does her certification in for those of you who are interested in it. You can also get her tools that for how you can take your clients through the process, identify where they are at, and actually get them to move up this, this uh, state. The polyvagal theory is a, another one that is becoming more and more included in, term, in the intercultural trainings. And the uh, issue is, there, there's one issue about this, and it's like the triune brain. It, the, it polyvagal does talk about the evolution of our nervous system. And we don't look at it in terms of the, the evolution. It's the vagal system is based on the vagus nerve. It is the longest nerve. It goes through your body and starting at the top and through it. And as it goes through, it touches different three major areas of the body and the first one is all about it's about the ventral vagal is for safety it's about connection so now all of a sudden if you want to go into this direction of, of um, neuroanthropology and looking at it in terms of uh, neuroscience this is one of the areas so we talk about when people are feeling happy and when they're feeling good They've got those smiles. This is going on in our head. And we can relate pretty well to people. Then, hmm, all of a sudden, we're getting a little bit more upset. Uh, the sympathetic nervous system kicks in. And that is our fight and flight. Which way do we go? We're assessing what kind of danger it is. That limbic system is going round and round. And as we do that, it, we will either take action or if it is too life-threatening, if we are too upset, we become immobilized and we just don't, can't move. We can't get out of bed. I remember doing clients who would be speaking about when they did their move, they would say, well, you know, they, they just can't get out. They can't drive. They can't, they, get, they start off and they drive from just the, the beginning of their driveway to, to the end of it. And they're in Amsterdam. It's flat but they are still so uh, traumatized by this move, whereas others are a little bit higher up and they are getting out there and they may be depressed or whatever, but at least they have a different reaction to it. And one of the tools that you can use from her is what we call the, automat the autonomic ladder. And it's all about when it gives us a better tool to help a client through, if you're doing in a cultural training or you're helping anyone to move through it, is to say, where are you? You start to ask them questions about um, how are you feeling? What is happening around you? And as you do that, as you take them through this letter, and I am not going to go into the details on it, but we'll be in, um, in there, I think, and if... Um, our proposal goes through, and if not, we do many workshops on this, and you will want to do your take a look at her work. Uh, Deb Dana is based on Stephen Forges. He came out in, in 2005 with his first first book that got a lot of attention on the polyvagal theory. Deb Dana has about 22 of them, and this has become one of the um, new additions, I think, to how we present. And let me just go back and ask in the chat if you have any, we've got some great things that of anyone who, for the vagal, has anybody been using this in their work, the polyvagal? Cynthia, I'm going to, while people are responding to you, I'm going to say we just have a few minutes left. Okay, um, so I'm going to take you quickly. We'll hold that one because I know some of you will want to leave. And the um, on the scarf model, the this is one that I use most frequently. 
And this is, again, with the idea that our mind will immediately go towards threat and it will bypass its safety. We have a tool for this. Please uh, check with the Neural Leadership Institute at you. Again, you can get certified on doing this. And they have identified five areas that people need to have to remove themselves from threat. This is one that I use quite frequently with my clients in role plays and use them in case studies. Anyone who was with uh, my last one has seen this. It's where we people need to know that they're respected, they're in the loop. They are given choices. How do they relate? Is it team? Are they our team or fairness? And so I have given the case study of uh, Kazakhstan where to put together something that was very challenging where we had, we had five different nationalities, very different in town and work. This, when they asked me to do an intervention on SCARF, it is what I went to because what we were able to do and make noticeable difference was with status by doing the trainings themselves, by including women in those trainings for the first time, by setting up a new system of, um, of teams and talking about people, just even talking about people's cultures in the beginning. They had never done anything like this. So being able to share who they were, people from Georgia talking about that. Third, they were respected and valued. We had the Chinese go into great depth about what they, about their culture. The certainty, now remember people would rather know you don't know than you do know at all. So town hall meetings, autonomy, were they given choices and control? So here we set up special, uh, special teams for a team in change. They got special friends. They were recognized as the people, posters, Relatedness is do they belong? So we did, we did, um, if you've heard my before, that was the birthday parties that turned things around, being able to acknowledge people, being, being bowling at night, these kinds of things to pull people together in the age of Zoom. How can you get sharing going on? And mainly fairness. Do we get the credit and opportunity? So we taught people how to do things very differently. So if I had not just been in a uh, crisis, a real crisis in the Middle East here, um, I would ask you to apply the SCARF model to the same way in what you see as going on here. It's very, to do it as a group, any, in any case, we've got such different points. I'd like you to think about it. I'd like you to take it home on uh, your home, but I'd like you to, to think about how you might apply this. Would it, what is missing in terms of, of any of this? And then certainly, you know, would, where is the role of AI? What does that have to do with, with us as intercoastalists? And finally, to be right on time here, I will close with the words of Nalini Ambadi, which was one of our, the first people really to do this. And he wrote in the Encoded Brain, one of our very first articles, um, she, we lost her way too early in 2013. But her words are the reason for this presentation, my work, and any way I can help you and we can help others, which is, as she said, let's take our, our academic research and findings and see if we can apply it to make changes in the real world. So that's where I leave us. And I leave us with wanting to know from every one of you how we as interculturalists can make changes in the real world. How can we all help each other to get those tools um, to be able to take this to a different level? So okay. I think I'm right at the end of my time, and Cindy will keep us to that. But I'm going to look in my chat and see if um, I have somebody. Do you have reference of exercises that can be done? Are you if you're talking about the polyvagal? Um, yes, I do. And you would want to go to. Uh, I suggested just that one simple one, and you can go to the up. Um, Deb Dana has a number of workbooks 
He even has a great one I recommend, which is called the flip chart, Kelly Bagel flip chart. You put it right next, it's a little complicated. You put it right next to your, your monitor and you have the, um, to take you right through it, it is great graphics, um, things you can apply. And the other references I have is SCARP. Absolutely, go to the the um, MLI, David Rocks, the Neural Leadership Institute. They are the creators of SCARF, but they have many models to, to look at. I see, um, for instance, I see Milton Bennett, who's a T I left off last time, and I thought so badly bad, please go to him. Uh, he's got some, I think you all do. We need to meet again, we need to share. And I do plan on adding a lot more to this in my upcoming seminars. So if you're for CPO. So Thank if you, you want, Cynthia, very much. Thank you. Let's take a one second pause. We continue this in a minute, but I think um, if we can stop sharing for just a second, and then uh, Victoria is going to have an announcement. And then for those who can stay for a few minutes longer, uh, we can do that. Um, okay. If it, Victoria, are you, if you can go ahead and yes. stop sharing? Yes. yes. And I okay. just wanted to let say me, that. Let me do that. There we go. I've yeah. got it. Cindy, what is the next month, Dan? Next month, do you remember? <laughs> what is I this is the fourth. Uh, it should be the fourth of the fourth, December. The fourth of I'm... December? The fourth of December? Yes. And I've seen Pierre here. Pierre, are you still here? Pia, Pia, yeah. So Pia is our um, leader and speaker for the next for the next day and meet up on the fourth. And maybe you know that Pia has just published together with Co Orsett a book. Pia, have you got by chance the book next? Yes. And this is the meeting cookbook. So we are going to discuss um, not the book, but what is inside. Yeah. <laughs> and the announcement will follow soon. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Cynthia, we have a few more minutes. Um, if people have questions for Cynthia, I, um, there's one thing I would like to say, Cynthia, is we're going to have, uh, after this, we do a little bit of a follow-up letter. Mm -hmm. And it would be great if you could send to me different ways that people can find you and learn more and uh, whatever suggestions you might have so that we can continue this. I feel like we've just barely scratched the surface and that there's a lot more we can do. So when you get a chance and you're not so busy in Cairo, send me a little note and I'll send it off to Electricity and water, this is, this is 